And the same is true for the Sutter County Board of Supervisors. However, Yuba City City Council is going to be meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. And they're going to adopt their uh, city's fiscal year 2014-2015 operating capital budget uh, tomorrow. And also setting their appropriation limits. The Marysville City Council meets at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And they have a couple codes that they're going to be looking at, uh, ordinances to add. And one that I saw in there that was interesting, that might be of interest to you also, is that they're going to approve an exception to the Marysville Municipal Code section to allow the Northern Recon Group to operate one of their motorized crafts, one of the ducks, on Ellis Lake July 4th. So I guess that's to replace the boat races, I don't know. But they will, they're going to have uh, the military duck on the water. Our next meeting is going to be June 16th. And we're going to show the movie, the video, on chemtrails, and it's called Climate Engineering and Weather Warfare. This is really important. A lot of people think it's uh, just kind of pie in the sky. It's not really happening. And when you look out and you see all these vapor trails, they, that's what they think, they're vapor trails. But not when they're going back and forth and crisscrossing and dropping aluminum oxide on you. So we have a very interesting video on this that gives you a lot of detail and it'll show uh, the interior of some of these planes with their big tanks and the nozzles and the spray in and uh, pretty much explain what they're doing, why they're doing it, and some of the unplanned consequences of what they're doing uh, as far as our environment and the trees uh, up in Northern California, I think they're really doing a lot of damage up, or, up around Siskiyou County and Shasta County. There's evidence. but So it's going to be an interesting movie, and that will be June 16th here, and it will be our next meeting rather than a regular meeting. We'll have popcorn and our snacks and normal and, and the movie. Uh, also, we just found out today that the Tea Party California Caucus, which is actually the Tea Party Caucus within the Republican Party at the Republican conventions, the Tea Party California Caucus is going to have their own convention Saturday, July 26th in Auburn. We encourage you all to go online, sign up, sign up and attend it. It's what the Tea Party's leaders are doing in California to counteract a lot of what's going on with both parties and especially the Republican Party uh, trying to bring it back to its original roots. So that'll be an interesting convention and that's July 26th in Auburn. Check out our website and uh, we have all the current updates on our events on the website. Also go to Facebook and like us. We're very likable on Facebook. And it just it's just listed in the Side Buttes Tea Party. Before we get to Paul and his presentation tonight, we're gonna get to Paul with a new feature that we're gonna have at every meeting now. And it's called In the News, and Paul's going to get up and give us a little, some little short excerpts of different things that are going on that you may or may not know normally. So we'll get to that right now, Paul. Oh, great. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be comedic at this point. I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> All I know is that for... Uh, how about Eric Holder? There you go. How about uh, Jay Johnson? We can talk about that one. Uh, or we can talk about the young man who is returning from Afghanistan. Really, I'm sure you'd all like to talk about that now, wouldn't you? Uh, the deserter who walked off 
which is what I'm hearing now. And of course, I got all the news on Friday night. We checked it all out. And, uh, he's got a lot of answering to do. And I guess in the military, uh, you can actually be shot for treason. Yep. So there's a lot more to this. But clearly what this is, it's Obama's way to distract away from the VA. It's clearly that. And here's the other thing that we've discovered, and, and you know, just sort of in the news, if you want to uh, hear, you won't hear this on the mainstream media. Actually, how much have you heard on the mainstream media about this? Not <laughs> really. Did you see it on Fox? Okay, forget Fox. The other, the other guys. Glenn Beck, maybe. Okay. All right. Well, uh, here's some really inside information that we're investigating. Is that uh, he converted to Islam a long time ago? We're talking about the sergeant now. Corporal or sergeant? Now. Sergeant now. Yeah, I'm kind of confused on that because he went in, uh, he, he walked off from his area as a corporal and is returning a sergeant. Is that how it works in the military? Yeah. Time, okay, all right. Time, I get the time and grade thing. Deserters get promoted. That's Obama's army. Um, okay, anyway, uh, but this is what we're working on, which is kind of interesting, is that uh, we think he might actually be a plan for a specific operation. How many have thought that? Well, look at <laughs> I got people buying into it already. But no, seriously, that's what that's what some of my people were telling me on Saturday morning about one o'clock in the morning. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. These things are so well thought out in advance. They absolutely are. And if you don't believe it, there's going to be more coming our way because there's more scandals that are going to come up, especially about the the VA. All right, you also heard what's happening with climate change. The climate is changing every day. Did you know that? In, in fact, I am predicting this because there's so many human beings on the planet that at approximate, well, I can guarantee this, this is going to happen at 9 o'clock tonight. It's going to be dark. <laughs> so Obama rolls out the big climate change thing today. Did you, did you guys hear about that? Okay, 30% uh, tax on carbon emissions from uh, any type of uh, you know generating companies like you know gas and electric companies who generate electricity. So coal is the big villain here. So what they're going to do? What that means is this: look for $10 a gallon gas in the next two years, easily. For those of you, I, I just love giving you all this good news, but you know, for those of you that are paying about $100 per month right now in electric, I was told earlier this morning that we can look for anywhere from five to $700 electric bills. Now what if you're already paying that? <laughs> $2,100. You know, I'm doing uh, common core math up here. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what are the, do you guys have any questions before I get started or Larry turns it over because it's a good time to ask questions about things. Yes, sir. Are we going to deduct 30% from what we owe China for their tax? <laughs> well, <laughs> China and Clive and Bundy. Yeah. Let, let me get into that. I interviewed Clive and Bundy the other day. Did anybody hear that? Yes. Anybody hear the interview? Yes. Excellent interview. Now, before I did the interview with Clive and Bundy, you know what I asked him to do? We had about a 90-minute conversation, almost 90-minute conversation, before we did the interview. Great guy. The guy's brilliant. Absolutely knows his land law. I said, could you do me a favor and just kind of pick up a copy of Agenda 21, the UN document, and read through it? So he did. And you know the reason why he's in trouble with the feds? You know the real reason? <laughs> no. He recognized Agenda 21 in 1993. And he didn't sign any of his contracts with the federal government for grazing. You see, because all of those contracts for grazing that he would have ultimately paid to them, they all said that he gives up all of his constitutional rights to his land. That's correct. So what Cliven did was said, that he told me on the phone, no and hell no. <laughs> and that's, the way, that's why Cliven Bundy's in trouble with the Fed. He's willing to pay the fees, but as he said on the radio, he has said on the radio many times, this is not my government for me to sign a document to. 
And he's right. It's the United Nations. And he picked up on that in 1993. Now remember, 1992, Agenda 21 was signed into soft law in Rio de Janeiro. That was June. October, Nancy Pelosi, love her to death. Nancy Pelosi brings in 353, H.R. 353. And what that is, is the House Resolution on Sustainability, which is adopting Agenda 21, which makes it possible to form the President's Council in January, February of 1993. And guess who's President? Bill Clinton. Oh, come on, you guys can't remember? Come on. So Bill Clinton... He, signed, he tells the BLM through the EPA, those wonderful people at the EPA, he tells them to go out and start charging all these range fees. And oh, by the way, make sure they sign these contracts. So that's what started it all. Cliven Bundy had 53, 52 other ranchers around him. And he recognized it as a document that was designed to manage him out of business and to get the land. The other 52 are gone. And he's the last man standing. I'll tell you a little story that came off the radio show, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So you guys that are th sitting there thinking about the militia doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Clive and Bundy, the day that they really started to show up from the BLM, he had an appointment in Las Vegas. So he gets in his car about 5 o'clock in the morning, and before he left, they had established snipers on all the mesas around his ranch house. They were lighting up his kids that were out in the ranch area. Snipers, numerous snipers. And patrols, cars, the white trucks, and all that stuff. He drives down the road, and there's white trucks all over the place, on the dirt road, as he calls it. And then when he gets to the oiled road, <laughs> there's more. And then when he gets to Highway 15, and he starts driving towards Las Vegas, there's two cars that follow him all the way into Las Vegas. But that happened to be the day that they put up the flags. Remember that? The militia showed up. And when he got back to his house, he really felt liberty, he said, because there was not one BLM agent around. They had left, they had turned tail and moved up into the mountains because the militia had arrived. The militia arrived. Now, of course, Obama and his people don't like that. No, they don't like that. Do no. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it just shows you, though, Americans stepped up and stood up, like I said, for the first time since the Civil War, and really had a big confrontation. And the Obama people are really angry about it. I'm getting the news reports now about it. But, hey, we got to do what we got to do as Americans. I'm done. Are you done with your in the news? I'm, in, I'm done out of the news. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's going to be a regular feature, and it will be more humorous from here on out. <laughs> Before we get into our regular program, how many teachers do we have here, administrators, principals, stuff? Raise your hand. They're previous, former. A lot of people won't admit it, huh? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, okay. There's quite a few here. Thank you. We had talked about doing this for quite a while. We had one about a year ago with uh, Orleon Cole. Orlean Corley. Orlean Corley. Orlean Corley. And people were first exposed to Agenda 21, and, and at that time we didn't know anything about it. And I think there was a lot of skeptic skepticism amongst the people here because we got a lot of phone calls and uh, emails and stuff and people are checking here and they can she said this and that didn't happen but it was really going on but it just hadn't been implemented and most of the administrators principals so forth in this in the school districts really didn't know a lot about it but they do now and we thought it was important to put something together and, and bring in an expert and while I'm at it, we have a special guest this evening, Jan Collins from Nevada County. And are you with the Nevada County Tea Party? Or? With the Nevada County Tea Party, and I founded uh, Common Core Concerns. 
Common Core of Concern, she's an elder, so she came to see what we're doing tonight and maybe assist or whatever, but uh, at this time I would like to reintroduce the world famous Paul Preston from Attendance 21 Radio and turn it over and we'll talk about Common Core. So nice to be back. <laughs> um, well, first, before we get started, and you know, uh, one of the things about Common Core, so you know where I'm coming from, 41 years in education, I was a custodian to superintendent. And it just so happened I started writing curriculum standards in the early 80s. And I was one of the first guys in the state uh, working with a school district to align the curriculum standards of a school district to county standards. That was in the mid-80s. And I'll explain standards here in a second. But the standards movement has been around since around the late 70s. It's culminated now in what we see with Common Core standards. And we're going to get into some of the details and all that good stuff. But let me tell you what it is, right up front. You know, I say this about my radio show, Stopping Totalitarianism one community at a time. I lump all the totalitarians into one group and all their ideologies and so on. And all of them seem to have the same core when it comes to education. And you're starting to see it surface here in this country known as Common Core. It's a totalitarian design. I know some of you that haven't been with me before, some of you educators, you're sitting there going, who is this guy? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm telling you that this is pure evil, and I use that term. So it's some serious business. It's serious business. I'll try and break out as much information for you as I possibly can, but I do want to tell you one thing that has happened. The non-mainstream media, you hear me talk about this on the radio show, the new stream media has really taken hold in this country, and right now, Obama and his people are absolutely befuddled about the phenomena of the anti-Common Core movement. By the way, Orly Corley, Phyllis Schlafly, two people that were enormously involved in the early days, because a lot of people didn't recognize what Common Core was, because it was being foisted upon us. You know, it's kind of, you know, you don't, when somebody tells you to do something, you don't know, know what to do, right? Because you weren't involving with, involved with the planet. Why would you know something about it? So Common Core is here, and we're having to deal with it. But people are slowly finding out about it, which is what I thought was going to happen all along. It's our only defense. So now state after state after state is starting to reject Common Core because they're looking into the details. Go figure. It's taken a lot of courageous people to step up and do this. I started, I started on my radio show back in 19, or 2019, 2009, when Obama came on board and I heard about Common Core and raced to the top. And I started some of the first protestations on the radio about it. And I've been protesting ever since. Race to the top, Common Core, just kind of get used to those two terms. Now, it takes people in the field, soldiers in the field, to stop it and to bring people to light about it. And that's what we've been depending upon when we talk about the mainstream media versus the newsstream media. We in the newsstream media are being listened to now more than ever. More people are getting their news and information out of laptops and cell phones, like 65%, than the mainstream media. That causes problems for Obama. And he knows it. He knows he's in trouble that way. So you have this literally this prairie fire that's blazing across the countryside knocking out Common Core standards in all the states that adopted it. And that's because of people like Jen, who we have here. And I'm introducing her because she's going to come up here and speak. Now she says she's absolutely terrified. But Common Core scares me more. There you go. <laughs> so come on up, Jen. And she's going to tell you what she's been doing as sort of a foot soldier trying to stop Common Core. Hi. I have to say, first of all, that I really appreciate that teachers have come. 
We did a town hall on April 29th in Grass Valley. We invited 635 teachers, individual invitations, hand mailed to them. We have 10 districts. We have, each district has five school board members. We invited all of them. We invited all of our superintendents and three people from a school board came. And they were from my district because they're used to seeing me at their board meetings and knew they better show up. <laughs> anyway, so anytime people come to look at the other side or get another opinion, I think is really awesome. Um, so I'm just a grandma. I'm not a, a Common Core expert. I'm just somebody with five kids, grandkids that are in school in Nevada County. They've started implementing Common Core a little bit this year. Um, I heard about it on Glenn Beck and said, this is pretty awful. It can't be real. And so I started investigating it. That was only about a year ago. I buried myself in research. And I finally felt like he does when he says he needs to duct tape his head. If I don't get off this couch and do something, I'm going to have to kill myself. So, so I did. I got up. I got on some Facebook groups. I started talking with other parents. I started telling my daughter, you need to take these kids out of these schools. You need to get private schools. You need to opt out of these tests. And she was like, oh, mother. And now they do. So for a year, we did that. Oh, mother, that's all you talk about. Well, it's really important. <laughs> They're indoctrinating your kids. This is not right, blah, blah, blah. So I heard one, a group in San Diego had Dr. Stotsky coming out to talk to them. And I saw it on Facebook, and I thought, I wonder if she'd come to Grass Valley, because nobody comes to Grass Valley. And so I called Darcy, and I said, do you think she would? And she said, yes. So we had Dr. Stotsky and Brad Dawkins from the Pacific Justice Institute, and um, Lydia Gutierrez, who hopefully will be our new superintendent of public instruction, so be sure to vote for her mom, um, come up and, and help us with our town hall. I want to tell you that I went to the tea party and I said, this is a great opportunity. This woman has a national reputation. You know, they already knew because I'm, I'm the common core lady. Every meeting I get up and say something. And they said, well, go ahead if you want. Maybe we'll be able to help you. I'm like, OK. I got a credit card. It's got a high limit. So I started charging it up. And I happened to get a person from the Tea Party that was an actual media genius. And we radio shows, advertising. We did massive amounts of advertising and radio shows. She got them. Um, she got her on Phil Cowan, on Armstrong and Getty. I don't even know some of the people that she was able to give interviews with. It was a really long, hard battle. But the hardest battle, well, let me tell you how I won that one. So the night of the event is coming. And I said to my daughter, people know me in this town. And they know how I feel about Common Core, because I'm going to every school board in 10 districts, talking during the five minutes you get ahead of time. And they know you, and they know you're my daughter, and you need to come to support me. And if you don't, you can forget ever talking to me again, because you're, you're done. <laughs> so she did, because I'm her mother. She sat in the back of the room, and I'm sitting up in the front, because you know we're doing the speaker thing. And I hear this voice asking a question. And I'm like, really? I turn around and look, and it's my daughter standing up and asking a question. Afterwards, she stayed and talked to all three people. And the next day, the next day, she opted her children out of the testing. That was worth $10,000. <laughs> 
Not only that, but she has mimeographed or photocopied those opt-out forms and been giving them to her friends. Her friends have been signing up for our mailing list to try to keep them up to date on things that we're doing or going to be doing or what's happening. Um, people stepped up and underwrote us so that I didn't experience any loss. Um, and that was wonderful, but the best part to me was that, sorry, When I first started, when I learned enough about Common Core, I started going to school board meetings and just listening, because I'd never been to one in my life, and kind of got the feel for it. So then I started asking questions about what they knew, and they don't answer you, really. So I talked to some of them after the meetings, and they really were not informed about Common Core. So the next meeting that I went to, I took two inches worth of information and gave it to each one of them. And then the next meeting, I asked questions. I had a meeting with the superintendent and asked her things like, do you know that the standards are copyrighted? No, she didn't know that. Did you know that most of our governors signed them without reading the agreement? No, she didn't know about that. There were about 20 questions, and I promise you, the woman did not know an answer to one of them. She is the superintendent of three schools in my district. I went to our county board of education and tried, or the Nevada, the high school board of education, and tried to get them to put on their website the fact that parents have the legal right to opt out of the testing, these field testing they just did. And one of their board members told me that he did not necessarily think that it was a good idea to give the public too much information. And it was not the school board's job to spoon feed the public and parents information. They could get it on their own. Our County Superintendent of Schools, and by the way, if you're in Nevada County, please vote for the other guy. <laughs> Basically told us the same thing, that it is not their job. When we ask her to post it on the county website and to ask the other schools to do it, she said that she was paid by the state of California and that to do that would be a conflict of interest and I'm like well don't our tax dollars go to the state who then pays you so therefore we pay you and you're an elected official elected by us to represent us and you think that's a conflict of interest so I want her to go away I just got this right before I came where freedom works and the Koch brothers are really getting organized with Fighting Common Core. There's going to be some big stuff coming down the pipe from these guys with more organizations than what we've been able to do so far because now they'll have, there'll be money. Unfortunately, it also gets a little politicized at that point, and I think that's unfortunate because this isn't about politics. It's not about left or right or Democrat or Republican or anything else. This is about our children. And I look out here and I see that we're all about the same age. And so I say to you, your children that have your grandchildren need for you, for us, to step up and fight this fight because they're so busy trying to put a rub over those kids' head and clothes on their backs and hold it together. Some of them work in two and three jobs. And most of us are lucky enough to have some free time. Use that free time, please, to protect your grandchildren, their future, and America's future. That's what we're all trying to do. Get on a Facebook page, subscribe to a, a feed. Californians Against Common Core is great. They have every city and town 
or at least a county, almost has a common core group. Go on the internet, search on stop common core, put in your city or your county. Get up with these people. They put on events, they'll help you put on events, they'll support you if you have questions. It gets old to write letters to your representatives, to talk to your representatives, to go to these school board meetings. Believe me, there's nothing more boring than a school board meeting. And, and I'm so well known now that they go, okay, this is a portion where the public gets a chance to speak about anything. Jan, do you have anything you want to say? And I'm like, oh yeah. I always talk, I check their agenda before I go because they post those on the website. If I see anything that looks like it may relate to Common Core, I zero in on it. And when that comes up on the agenda, I'm up. And I'm doing it. Go out there and fight for your kids, for your grandkids. That's it. one because what's happening in California because we're just implementing it the initial response from our teachers and administrators is very positive states like New York and Illinois and Kentucky and Tennessee those states back east and some of the Midwest they have been implementing it earlier than we are those are the teachers I would refer that person to I would show her or tell her about the other states two huge unions, 3.6 million teachers union employees, the unions backed out of backing Common Core. Our teachers association isn't quite there yet, but they're getting there because they hate the standardized testing. So. Oh, Billy's CTA is starting to think about this? Well, they turned down Gates, they stopped taking money from the Gates Foundation. That's about the only concession we've had. I do know from talking to our local representative that they are very much against the high stakes standardized testing, the smarter balance testing. I've heard the term common core, but quite frankly, I have no idea what it is. Paul's going to tell you all about it and try not to get too depressed <laughs> okay. and angry. <laughs> I don't have any with me, but you can go to our website where you can download it, or you can go to Pacific Justice Institute, and they have the forms. Can't you just have the teacher do the Common Core Long Division and then the regular Long Division? Maybe they give us some more. Well, sometimes it's as many as 103 moves. Well, that's a really good question. But they, they feel like that that's a better way to teach it that gives the children the more in-depth understanding of it. Um, myself, I was sort of mathematically challenged. I had never gotten out of first grade, and that's the truth. Yeah, Paul's going to tell you all the good ins and outs. So, and I'll stay for a few minutes afterwards if you have any questions that I can answer. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, it, it's. Uh, I'll get to. I'll we'll answer the questions. I I, pro I promise that. Um, well, I just hope you're just not on the floor when I'm done. <laughs> it's just falling out of your chair, because some of the stuff. Um, in relationship to Common Core and about what you're going to hear about is just absolutely amazing. And especially in this day and age uh, when we have such good communications you know, available to us, uh, why, you know, in fact, everybody has been left out of the planning for Common Core and raised the top. So, 
if, you know, we're still all supposed to be transparent as public educators and stuff like that, right? Just like Obama's transparent? <laughs> so we're kind of getting there. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about me because you need some background. 41 years in education, administrator for over 26 years, uh, up to superintendent, assistant superintendent, assistant principal, principal, all that stuff. Um, I have a major uh, gang background, actually, got drugs and uh, gang um, action with education. And uh, I've also done a, a lot of curriculum and standards development. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, first radio show to condemn Race to the Top which was the law that came into place that brought us Common Core. Because I recognized it as something of totalitarian nature, which is going to get to your question in a second. In other words, I recognized it as the complete federalization of public schools. Anybody heard of a Tenth Amendment? Okay. We started doing radio, I did, over 14 years ago, on the, I called it the Inside Education Show. First show of its kind in the nation. I talked most always about the high dropout rate in California. And at that time, the dropout rate they were saying was, oh, you know, anywhere about 15% in California. Now, I knew as an administrator, <laughs> I could do the numbers real quick on the data that I had. It was well over 25% at the time. Now, it's interesting, my calculations for California's dropout rate is at 35% and higher in some places. LA Unified admits to over 50% dropout rate. I just called last week the people at the Department of Education. Oh, well, you got it all wrong. We're at 8% dropout rate. Really? <laughs> you know, 8%. And then when they do the numbers after five years, it's only 4.3% dropout rate in California. Now, don't you love that? I mean, I just wonder why there's so many kids out there getting in criminal gangs and everything. Can't understand that. Of course, they're lying. So I asked the fundamental question because I know how to calculate real dropout rates. You can't fool me. I said, hey, <laughs> are these numbers audited? Well, occasionally somebody comes in and looks at everything. And, and I said, no, 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 no. Are all these numbers from the schools audited? No. So can the schools be lying? You think? In this high test, in the high testing stakes environment, are they lying? You bet you they are. They're not giving all the facts and information about dropouts. I stick with that number. In the nation, they say, just generally speaking, in our nation right now, we're at about 30% dropout rate. Those are people not completing high school. Now here's a number that's going to floor you. What is the dropout rate for kids after the first year of college? Over 50%. They go one year to college, maybe, and then they drop out. So what are we doing? Well, the colleges, they're out there advertising for students from foreign countries. Right? Now they get a two for there. They get the so-called top students, plus they get out-of-state tuition. The UC system right now has said the heck with California students from high schools. We want those foreign students, because they pay top dollar. So the kids that are getting the high GPAs here, kids that are out there getting the 4.4s and all that good stuff, and they've been in a million clubs, they go to the back seat. They go to the backseat of the bus when it comes to UC systems and CSU systems to get in because they want the students that are out of state because they pay the higher tuition fees and out of the country. They're top priority. And you and I are paying for those universities. Isn't that startling? So it does kind of point out some of the problems that we have at the higher end of things. Go ahead, Nancy. <laughs> okay, this is where it all starts, and, I, and you need to have some fundamental background. I like to try and give you this. It's called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. This leads to race to the top. Now, I could spend hours, but I'm not going to because it's boring <laughs> to talk about all these different things here. But think back to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
And the Elementary and Secondary Education Act came from that, which means you have to give equality to education. That just sort of stands for reason, right? Regardless of your skin color, because we all remember what it was like with segregation back in the day. Calls for high standards and accountability back in 1964. And look at this one. Explicitly forbids the establishment of national curriculum. It forbids it. And what they were doing there was protecting local school boards. They did not want to have a communist system of education where all power in the curriculum is disseminated from Washington, D.C. Okay? Was authorized through 1965. And then they go uh, to this, what's called a reauthorization process. It, it basically provides a lot of grant money for things that they say that might cause segregation in schools. Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV, things of that nature. Currently, the ESEA was authorized in 2001 as No Child Left Behind. How many have heard of that? Everybody. Right. Nickel B, No Child Left Behind. High stakes testing was introduced. High standards for accountability was introduced. The states had to come up with those standards. The states had to come up with the standards. The local school districts did not. So what are we leaving out there? What involvement are we leaving? Local school districts. So we start to see the local school districts being shunned and being held accountable at the state level, right? So there goes some autonomy. Now this is where it really gets interesting. It's not been authorized since 2001. Um, the Obama administration, since it wasn't authorized, and it was calling for an authorization back in 2000, six and 2007, and then 2008 it wasn't authorized. Oh, we'll let the Obama administration do this. <laughs> right. And doesn't Obama play well in the sandbox called Congress? <laughs> no. Sure, he'll work with Congress to come up with real authorization. And of course he didn't do that, did he? He came up instead with something called Race to the Top. And Race to the Top was a competitive grant program. It has nothing to do with uh, whether or not it's legal or not. There's been no authorization for this. So it might come into question, is race to the top legal? A lot of scholars who look at it say it's not. I say on the out front, it's not. Because they're asking you to volunteer, they're asking you to participate, but they give you guidelines. They don't give you mandates. You do it voluntarily to yourself. Because you're offered money. Isn't that slick? Kind of like Clive and Bundy, if you think about it. Um, this is what it does, though. States have to go into an agreement and change their whole, le through the legislative process, change their uh, relationship with the federal government. And they have to comply with the mandates that are in Race to the Top as the, in the grant program, which means that the states give up their right to education. Tenth Amendment. So in 2008, what was happening? Big recession, right? Who had all the TARP money? Neil Cash Perry. <laughs> I'm serious. Who was controlling all the money that came out of, remember 2008 we had a big problem? Cash Perry. And who was Neil Cash Perry working for at the time earlier? At the beginning it was George Bush. And he had the troubled assets relief money. That's all the money that they needed. And all that money found its way through these race to the top grant programs. And of course, the troubled assets relief program was supposed to be for all the banks that couldn't fail because they're so big, right? Do you get my drift about Neil Cash Carey? I hate to bring that name up. Tomorrow's a day. Anyway, um, so states, in order to do this, give up their rights to education to the federal government so the federal government can do whatever they want. If they apply for a race to the top. But you have to do this before you can even make out the application for the grant. Does that make sense? So in other words, if you apply for a grant right now, let's say to a private uh, nonprofit, 
there's a hundred million dollars at uh, XYZ nonprofit, and you think you qualify for that grant. Right now, you just fill out the application, you submit it with all your documentation, and they give you a yes or no, right? There's no requirements before that, is there? Uh, we want you to you know, sell your house before you even apply. We want you to sell your house, sell your car. Uh, your firstborn, got to go. Um, and you're just left standing alone. Then you can apply. After you've done all that, show proof, and then you can apply. Sounds a little backwards, doesn't it? You see, that's exactly what they did. They turned it upside down. So it was a backward process to get that money. But if you're a state like California, you're desperate for money in 2008, aren't you? You're how many billions of dollars in debt in 2008 and 2009? And Arnold Schwarzenegger, in 2010, January 7th to be exact, signed AB, uh, SB 1, see, 5 1 and 5 4. That's what they did. They, he signed those into law, which meant goodbye education for the state of California, goodbye autonomy for the state of California, goodbye autonomy for all the school districts in the state of California, and all the other 45 states who do also. They were federalized, just like that. Information now is going to come by way to the curriculum, by way of standards from race to the top to all these 45 states who signed up for it. And where's that gonna come from? It's gonna come from eight individuals who sat down and decided, oh, we're so smarter than the rest of the people in the United States, and we're gonna come up with Common Core. I hope answer your question. I have no idea who these people are. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a couple names. Uh, what are the other ones? Remember? Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, this is an upside down system. And for me as an administrator, school administrator, who's done this forever, don't ever ask me to write another curriculum standard, please. Because the process is laborious if you do it right. Because it involves everybody. Every, all the state, we call them stakeholders. One of the things I do is I uh, represent the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, and I go out and accredit schools. WASP, right. I'm one of their guys that go out and <laughs> raises a little hell every once in a while with schools. Uh, you know, you're just kind of screwing with everybody here. <laughs> it really is a kind of interesting job, and I do it for free. But, you know, what happens in WASP is they teach you how to gain the confidence of the stakeholders, the people you serve in the school, in your school. And what WASP wants to see is school autonomy, that people are making decisions on their own, that it's not the school district, it's not the school administration that's telling the teachers what to do. It should come from parents, students, teachers, administration, in that order, grassroots. You want to do something in your school? You want to have a curriculum? You want to come up with some standards for your school? Those are the people you talk to. Do you see what they did here? Eight people, 330 million people, eight people from Washington, D.C. starts to sound a lot like what they didn't want in 1964, which was the height of the Cold War for the war with communism. They didn't want communist style education. So now we have the dictates of these eight people who have brought us Common Core. Now, Sandra Stotsky, who, uh, she showed up and talked, right? It, it, yeah. She's a good friend of my radio show because I started talking to her back in 2009. <laughs> and she and I hit it off like that. <laughs> now, when you leave here tonight, it's just the magic of radio, but at 9 o'clock, you can listen to the interview that I gave of her, her and I talking on last Friday's radio show, 1410 AM. She's one of the major gurus of, of fighting Common Core. She actually was asked to be a moderator to look at those standards through Common Core that were developed. She looked at them and said they're garbage. And so did some other people that they asked to be moderators because they recognize something very fundamental. And when you listen to Sandra Stotsky talk, she talks a lot like me. We knew it as administrators. You involve people and get them to be involved. Because what do you want? 
you want them to run the schools. You might not like the results of what you get, but you know, you're not sitting there like the king telling them what to do. Did, did I make my, did, was that sensical? <laughs> I mean, don't, you want to own it. And you know, like Clive and Bundy says, you need to listen to the interview, it's on our website. He says it so well. He says, we have to blame ourselves for what we're seeing right now because we haven't been participating in governance. He said that. Right. And he's absolutely right. Nobody was you know, awake when these school board members started boring you to death at the meetings, which is a ploy. It's a, it's a way to manage you out of their lives. And then you get into this whole thing about what? Well, you know, they know more than you because they're experts. That's garbage. The moment you hear that from a school person, you better get in their face. And be very polite and say, look, you serve me. And get it straight with them. And do it in public. Tell them straight up. Because that is when they start to feel like little totalitarians. <laughs> they get armed with their own, uh, their own knowledge that yet you don't have. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. They need to be receptive. And one of the things when we go into schools, like I said, we go to visit with the superintendents and say, okay, how are you running your schools here? Are you running them? Or are you letting them run themselves? Are you listening to your people? And if we sense that a superintendent is running their schools or running their boards, that's a black mark. You see, the West WASC is accreditation for schools. A school that loses its accreditation just might as well close it up. There will be people fired and so on uh, because of the, uh, how they're conducting the management of their school. So always look for that WASP symbol. That's a, that's a very good symbol to see on your public schools. Everybody's under attack in public schools. We understand that right now. And actually even in the private schools because of Common Core. Did that help answer your question? No. You have a question? You know, um, uh, <laughs> you bring up something really good, and this sound is why. Well, sound bites. Sound bites. Yeah, sound bites to death. You can't do it all in one meeting. And like right tonight, I'm throwing a lot of things at people, and people are going, "I can see it already in your eye." Like, whoa. Um, and a lot of it is education ease and stuff you just can't connect to. But uh, you have to keep coming back. And this is what's really hard about the battle that we're fighting right now, is that people are so inundated with information. That's all by design, by the way. And you have to keep coming back and talking truth to them and be somebody who's stabilizing. You know, some of the, I, had, I had some absolutely outstanding conversations with uh, three veterans over the weekend. Uh, one of them would tell you, as of, I think, uh, Wednesday of last week, I'm a certifiable idiot. I'm serious. Another one just can't get enough of me, you know. <laughs> okay. And the other one's always been kind of lukewarm. But it was an opportunity because I had to travel, do a little bit of traveling, and uh, was on the phone a lot. And I had the opportunity to actually listen to them because the, it was the veterans' that mess that really put them over the edge. And all I've been doing is just talking about it. <laughs> we brought up the Veterans Administration problem. Uh, 11 months ago with Chris Street and his uh, stories that he did on the Oakland VA. We've never left it. We brought it up and brought it up and brought it up. And they were thanking me. Even the guy who thought I was an absolute pinhead was all over it. He's a believer. And that's what happens when you get out there and you start talking this stuff to them. You see, I'm not so angry about what's contained in the standards. I, I could care less about the standards that they have up here. See, I love the California state standards because I helped to write some of them. Right? At least I had input. I had input when I was an administrator. So I felt like, hey, that's part of me, right? See, what I'm upset about is the violation of our Tenth Amendment. What I'm upset about is the loss of autonomy. 
And what I'm upset about is totalitarianism right here in my own country. That's what bothers me the most. And they're using kids to do it. Kids do not matter in Common Core. I'll tell you, kids, in my world, kids come first. That's just the way it is. How many of you are educators? How many have had that said to you before? I mean, and that's in your heart, right? Sure. It's just automatic. You talk to the people that are in right race to the top and the common core people, it's not about kids. It's about the money. It's about are you being responsible? Are you following orders or direct? Are you teaching right now? Oh, thank God. And who's teaching actively? Anybody? Pick on you. Come on. <laughs> anyway, it's all about how systematic you can make it. Almost robotic for education. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way it works. When you start turning it over like that, you are looking at kids as objects and not students. Yeah? It's like that uh, president of one of the big teacher unions that's right there on tape and you're watching it. He said, it's not about the kids, it's about power. Right. Yeah, it's about power. Yeah. That's all it is. That's all Common Core is. It's about the federalization of public schools. It's about control from Washington, D.C., and everybody else forget about it. You can, they don't want you to think independently. It, and it's the strength of this country to, to think independently and do independently. We get the terminology American exceptionalism because we have autonomy and we've always celebrated individuality in this country. Something very strange and unique as opposed to other countries on the planet. But that's what our Constitution provides for. And very easily, I don't even been out of the country before. Foreign lands. How many times are you out of the country and they recognize you as an American before you even say anything? How many, how many times have that happened before? They just say, oh, there's an American. Yeah, right there. You know, you are recognized, you are recognized as an American. I don't care what race, color, or creed you are. Foreigners recognize Americans. You are. Yeah, it's our attitude. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, here's something that's really interesting. Where did the idea of Common Core first come up? Okay. I always love to blow people away with this. Well, we'll talk about that. I got the floor now, girlfriend. <laughs> This is when it first appeared really in public. There's, a, there's something else going on here, I'll, I'll, and I'll let Jan talk about this. Because I, don't, I want to articulate this to link it, what she's saying. So pay attention here. This is where it first appeared in a publication as something moving forward. And there's issues that predate it. In fact, you can go to this Common Core thing all the way back to around the turn of the last century, if you really want to go that deep. It first appeared in 2006 when former Arizona governor, Janet Napolitano, Big sis. Big sis. who was chair of the National Governors Association, she wrote a 2000 and two, the 2006 and 7 initiative of the year designed to improve math and science and better align post-secondary education, and a task force was formed, and that began Common Core. Isn't it amazing how these players just keep popping up? Okay, now Jan's got another link, because I didn't go back far enough. I, we could go back a long time, but there's things with the prior administration. Go ahead. I don't have all my notes here, so it's not fair. Um, back when Bill Clinton got elected, a man by the name of Mark Tucker, and I'm not sure, was he with the Education of Iran? I don't know who he was, wrote a letter to Hillary, and he was so excited to, that Bill got in. He couldn't believe it. It was going to be wonderful. They could change the whole education system and make it what they wanted it to be, and align it across the nation. And I mean, you can search on the internet on Mark Tucker's letter to Hillary. It's infamous. It's in the register, the National Register in Washington. Well, the, and the key, the key thing she said there was when Bill Clinton was elected, and when he took office in January of 2003, or, yeah, 1993. And, um, Again, what happened in June of 1992, United Nations Agenda 21 was signed. 
it has links to that. So that's, you know, that's why I do Agenda 21 radio, I guess. <laughs> anyway, it led to a report for benchmarking for success. Benchmarking is a key word that's always coming up with Common Core and the related curriculum. There's always these educational terms that come up with uh, Common Core and this whole movement for federalization of schools. And it was ensuring students receive a world-class education. World-class education. Now, interesting though, world-class education is what I got when I went to California public schools. And most of you did too. In fact, it was emulated so much that the Chinese took a lot of our infrastructural designs and in the 90s implemented it for their own education system in China. It's working pretty well for them right now. But ours has been dismantled, which is another thing. Okay, this I bring this up, this is actually from one of my other speeches, but the term totalitarianism, uh, subject, uh, totally subject to an uh, absolute state authority, and that's what education is becoming now. You can see that, this whole federalization process. Um, and this, this statement here, a totalitarian regime crushes, crushes all autonomous institutions. Okay, I don't care who you're talking about as a totalitarian, they do that. And right now I'll put it to you that the Obama administration is actively trying to crush educational institutions, school boards, all throughout the nation. That's where raised and, and you see, what I'm getting to you to a point to understand is what Jan started to understand. A lot of citizens started to understand on their own, like, we can't let the, gov the federal government do that. Plus, you know, where was I? How many of you were involved in the development of Common Core? Oh, come on now. There was only eight, so I know there's no, none of those people here. See, you were not involved because they did not want you involved because you're not necessary. You don't know what you want. Leave it to the experts. Oh, this guy. Hitler. Yeah. Yep. Quick question for you. Um, could you explain your reference to uh, the Tenth Amendment reference to Common Core? Pardon me? About the uh, states' rights? Exactly. Okay, the states' rights, in other words, not enumerated by the federal government belong to the states. And education is one of those not enumerated. That's, does that answer your question? Yeah. In fact, you caught me flat-footed because I do have the copy of my Constitution out of my truck I didn't bring. I was, ready, I was ready to just throw it in your face, you know. <laughs> but that's where that comes from, so thank you very much. Um, this is what his education system was. It all came from him and his people. Education was mandatory. Strict indoctrination to Nazi ideology, him. Education was hard uh, and weakness was not tolerated. Those that were weak were taken out. They didn't get an education. And this is what he described. Pretty chilling stuff. My program for educating youth is hard. Weakness must be hammered away. In my castles of the Teutonic Order, a new youth will grow up before which the world will tremble. I want a brutal, domineering, fearless, and cruel youth. Youth must be uh, all that. It must be, it must bear pain. There must be nothing weak and gentle about it. The free, splendid beast of prey must once again flash from its eyes. That is how I will eradicate thousands of years of human domestication. That is how I will create the new order. Yeah, Philip. We're just missing one word, word there, aren't we? All these guys. Okay, where did we get free public education in America? We got them from these guys. Yeah. Actually, it's the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. Now, those of you that have studied Karl Marx, you know that he never saw communism play out in his lifetime. Do you know that? He didn't know what it was about. He never saw what was going to happen. So people took it on their own. But this one right here, number 10 of the plank, important. 
says that, uh, free education for all children in public schools and abolition of ch uh, children's factory labor in its present form in combination of education with industrial production. Does that sound a little bit like Common Core? Those of us that have been seeing Common Core recognize that one immediately. Now, why did we succeed in our country with Karl Marx in mind? Well, <laughs> because we had school boards. People could free think it. They could manage their own money. It wasn't the state telling them what to do. And that blocked the Marxist. And they didn't like it. <laughs> when, we, you know, when we as Americans came up and said, well, you know, we've got to have this thing like a school board, kind of like a Congress, you know? They can be representatives, and we can give input, and we can talk about legislation. And all the Marxists went nuts in this country. And they went nuts for years. Until they could come to a point where we're at today, where they're telling us what to do. That's how long this process has been. Am I popping any dots out there? <laughs> Connecting dots? It's been a long process to get to this point. Now that we're at this point and we're identifying this, they hate it. They hate this whole common core business where everybody's jams rising up and telling them about what's happening and what that shouldn't be happening. But of course, here's the problem. The useful idiots are in play. Who would be the useful idiots in play now? Who? <laughs> well, the politicians for sure, right? Teachers and the education community as a whole. But a lot of, listen, I want to tell you though, did you recognize what was going on with Common Core when you were in education? You didn't see it. It's very stealth. Did you? Whole language, right? You don't read, or you don't learn to read by memorizing, which is what Dick and Jane was in the 60s. Well, uh, and, and whole language, by the way, was one of the precursors to Common Core uh, English, which is what Sandra Stotsky is all about and fighting. But the educators don't know what's going on because they're not being told, and they're not being allowed to engage. It goes back to that whole thing about WASP when I go out and visit schools. Are the teachers engaging and having an effect on what's going on in education is the question. And if they're not participating and not being involved in engaging, that's a black mark on the school. That's one of the things that tips you off whether they're totalitarians or not. Um, in the 60s, the state asserted more control of local schools. Uh, and again, 2001, No Child Left Behind was increased to federal control because we started putting in high test, uh, stakes testing. And it was also connected to what happens if you're a failing school. So what that did is it made a shift away from the teacher having autonomy in the classroom to teach freely to now start teaching to a test. And that's going on big time. Kids aren't learning. They're not learning. They're learning how to pass a test. And I'll tell you, that's a different kind of animal than somebody who's been able to think freely and develop freedom of thought. They don't want that. Here's another one for you. This is for you New World Order people. Did you know that there's Common Core in other countries? Let's try Kenya. There's a Common Core curriculum in Kenya. Not to dislike what ours is. I know that's Obama's homeland. <laughs> and use this example of the type of when he gets it like Kenya. <laughs> okay, but here's the deal. If you're going to have standards and you're going to have to have testing, yes, sir? Yeah, I wanted to know about the common core because I taught for 38 years and I, I have a third grade girl uh, who goes to grade school in Southern. So I, I taught the common core math that there were 20 items and 30 in the uh, language arts. And she did very well. And also, I've always had a tongue. And when you make these connections, so you remind me of uh, John uh, McCain told me that he used the term black words. Oh, God. Because John McCain. 
there are so much distortions, half-truth, lies. Uh, it's hard to believe that people can listen to you and accept so much of what you're saying. That's just like chemtrails. Oh, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's okay. I wanted to come here and see what it was like. And I am amazed. Okay, just remember the tinfoil hat business. Always check your sources. Always check your sources. Always, always, always. No matter what we say, yep, check them. Check but getting, getting back into the, the business about the standards and so on, there's testing that's involved, and testing, remember, is high stakes. And what happens in high stakes testing is there's a lot of value to it. So they have these companies that come out and do the standardized testing. And these kind of companies make a lot of money. So when they're selling curriculum in the United States, they're also selling the same test, and they're selling the same curriculum in Kenya, and the same test. It's a global reach for all this. A big company that's involved with that is Pearson Education. They're the big money behind testing. It's worldwide, and it's moving worldwide quickly, because you have the computers. Yes. To my contention for decades that the school publishing is what drives the school system and everything and the curriculum. And Johnny can't read, so they always have to come up with a new curriculum, which is billions of dollars. And then he still can't read, let's go to a new curriculum. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's what when I was in school, man, you go from one to one to one, and, and now you can't pick up a book and then go to the next book, you don't understand it. Right. And, and, uh, and that's by design because they make more money anytime you make a new textbook adoption. Right. It, it's billions of dollars. It's billions of dollars. And it's billions of dollars at stake at, right now with Common Core and the success of Common Core that it's delivered all throughout the United States. Why do you think Jeb Bush is doing what he's doing? He's telling everybody to support Common Core. And why you have these commercials out there, Common Core, Common Core, Common Core. Yes. <laughs> One thing I'd like to <clears throat> mention there, there is a lot, I mean, Paul said the same thing, but there is a lot of cheating to achieve higher standards so they get more recognition. Now, is the main point of this, last year, in a, I believe it was Atlantic City, or right. in Georgia, there was a black lady who was the Crop. She was the number one uh, superintendent of schools in the United States. They even went to Washington to dark the resident. They found out she was cheating everywhere. Yeah. And, and Millions of dollars of wasted. One of the things that, that I have a problem with as an educator uh, with the whole uh, high stakes testing and having it on such a grand scale where everybody's held accountable all throughout the nation to one thing, um, is you get cheating like that. You know, you have uh, perfectly legitimate teachers who are doing a really good job and they fall into the, you know, the cheating thing. Or administrators like that superintendent. It's happening all around the nation. And going to the air, air, airport cabin. Right, same thing. It, it's the same thing. Um, anyway, Race the Top is a voluntary grant program uh, for the state to turn over their state's rights in education, and of course it's mandated, not law. It's mandated by the grant itself, but it's not law. Please understand that. It's not funded. Uh, I got one for you. You want to do um, Common Core Math? Um, okay. Two years ago, Chris Street, who's co-host on the show, as you know, used to be the treasurer of Orange County, right? Not a bad gig. Not, it's a lot of money and everything. And Chris really knows his numbers. And he, we started talking about, you know, what's going on with the California budget. And, and, you know, we started putting our heads together, and I was doing the school thing, and he was doing the other stuff. And he was calling uh, Chang and everybody and trying to get some numbers from him. And we said at the time, this isn't really a big secret because we broadcasted on the radio and talked about it, but we said at the time, it seems like there's like a $24 billion shortfall in the state budget two years ago. So Chris, you know, I can't find out where, you know what. I said, well, it's easy, Chris. They're taking and moving money around within the budget itself. And, at, you know, when it comes up to June 1st, it's, ha it's happy. <laughs> it's all full. 
He goes, that's what they must be doing. Well, Common Core Math, Jerry Brown style, as of Saturday, press release out from Chang. There's a shortfall now because they, what did they do? They miss what? What's that word? Misstated. Misstated some of the numbers within the budget to the tune of $31.8 billion with a B. I, I did two things this morning before the show. You know, the show comes on at 9, and so at 8.45 I was calling the governor's office. No response. So after the show, I'm just the pursuit that got a guy, I call again. No response. No response whatsoever. And nothing on the website, and nothing on Chang's site. One article came out Saturday from CBS Channel 13 or whatever it is here in Sacramento about this. You think that might be an issue when it comes to the budget? They misstated it. At one point they misstated $9 million when in fact it was actually a misstatement. The real number was $9 billion. Yeah, Doug? Paul, he said auditing will make his department better. Did you get that part? No, yeah, I'm shocked. So I missed that one. <laughs> That's the tinfoil hat got the way. <laughs> um, okay, here's some other things too that really get me about Common Core. Common Core has never been tried before. Ever. There's been no model for it tried ever. But you have to do it here in your states. Is there something wrong with that picture? As I said before, when you develop curriculum in schools, sometimes it's a three year process before you even go out and think about buying the books. And oh, by the way, there, are no, there have been no books purchased for Common Core coming up in the next year. <laughs> it's not that they're on the computer, they just haven't gotten the books yet, because they haven't figured out what they're going to teach. But here it is. Hmm. Okay, so who's behind uh, Common Core? First of all, the state's governors got together and they came up with Common Core and the basic plan with these eight people. <laughs> And they met a lot of protestations, and that's where it really started. Because people realized they're going to be foisted upon all the states. And money was the lure. The bailout money was the lure to get these states to do it, and they did it. Well, this is my newfound friend. Wow. You've got it on video, man. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> oh, sorry. A little wrestling match with Arnie Duncan. You must have found out I was a conservative. <laughs> that was me and Arnie. I met up with Arnie back in 2011. Now, you know how the president really has no background, right? In anything he's ever done? Okay. So, I had an opportunity to sit down with a group of people in Arnie Duncan in Washington, D.C. to talk about grants and schools and you know, what was going on with reauthorization of um, No Child Left Behind. And it was an interesting question I didn't ask the question, but the, at the table were all educators, you know, 20, 30 years in the system. Nothing's going to fool us. So what happened was, Arnie starts to talk about the reauthorization, and he's kind of like stumbling because you could tell he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, we had already made our assessment, and after he left, we sat around and talked, as educators would do, and we all realized that Arnie Duncan is as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> I say that without hesitation. He has no educational background as an educator. He was put into the position to be the, I guess, the chancellor of the Chicago school districts by his Chicago buddies. And for a couple of years he was involved in that. And now he's in charge of the United States. But he has no clue what he's doing, I'm telling you. None. Arnie Duncan, U.S. Secretary of Education. That's it. That's it. His mom's preschool children. <laughs> yes, it, well, yeah, you know, I mean, it, as you look at all this, and I'm, I'm trying to be facetious, funny, or whatever, but isn't there something really wrong with the picture? Because it's all consistent throughout his administration.
and what we're seeing. Oh, big data. This is a question about common core and one of the other reasons why I don't like it. This is my make-believe cumulative record, cum folder, they call it. Educators, how many of you have seen these before? Okay, now when you go in your school and you want your cum record or cum records of students that are your students that you work with, you literally uh, have to sign your life away. And, then, and oftentimes, some schools, a person or a secretary has to go in the room with you and sit there as you go through the CUNE folder. They're top secret in education. These are all the records of every child in school. And they're written documentation. And they're secret. Top secret. But, you know, with Race to the Top, as part of that legislation that they signed like Schwarzenegger did, all this information goes to the federal government. Every bit of it. It gets into that big data thing. It all becomes electronic. And every bit of it is taken up. Now, I can tell you by looking at Q folders, I can tell you all kinds of stuff that most people wouldn't want to know about themselves. That, government's, that information is being turned over to the government by these school districts that have gotten into Common Core. That's a big data breach. That's my opinion. But I would never allow that to happen. I have a Well, no, that's, this is the, uh, this is, we need to all understand what's happening here is they're taking every bit of data about everybody that they possibly can. Right. Oh, yeah. And if parents, yeah. again, have rights, they're taking rights away from their own kids. Right. Okay. Um, now, some of you might be really kind of savvy as to where I'm going to go with this information next, especially with the young children. You have, can you speculate where I'm going to go with this? No, I'd like to say that I wish you would go to the person who's speaking with the microphone. Oh, okay. Because we don't hear what she's saying. Let's ask the question so you can hear it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you listen to what she has to say. Okay. Uh, I did preschool daycare in my home, and uh, I was real close to the uh, daycare association, and I brought stuff up about I was the only one that got a call from the health department who wanted to know about my kids, preschool kids, of their shot records. Uh, they wanted all the information and sent it to them. And every year they would do this, but I brought this up to the association of all the other providers, and they said, I've never heard about this. So I called license, and they said, well, this is a first for us too, but you're going to have to do it or we're going to fine you. So I said, well... I wasn't going to give that information out on the phone, first of all, because I don't know who I'm talking to. So I just gave the information, but I didn't like the feeling because that's private, that's between parents and the kids I'm watching, and I'm giving it out to, I don't know, I don't do like, I'm not licensed anymore. Too much. So does that make sense what I was, my answer to that response? Uh, there, um, I'm not too sure about the health records for your situation, but I know that they have to have something on file to show that the kids are, you know, have shots and all that stuff that are appropriate, just like if you have them in school. But they're going after more and more pieces of data at a younger age. And that's the gig. Now, let's take that data that started out very early on in a child's life, and let's track it, because you can now with big data. You can track it the child's performance through high school, now even college too. Now when you say you can track it, that's somebody sitting in Utah tracking it. They can see the coursework, 
the student has had, and they can predict the coursework that the student needs. The student doesn't have to make a decision about what coursework they're going to have. And neither does the parent need to be involved with the child's education. Because they can now program the teachers, they can program what comes through the computers to get the education they want for your child. That's some pretty powerful stuff. And don't think that isn't going on right now. It is. That's why big data scares me, in this sense. But we're hearing more things like yours, where they're calling and demanding it stuff from schools or from agencies, and they have no right to demand them. So it's always best to ask. But they're just doing that. And that's the lawless nature of what they do. And that's where we have to stop them. They, you know, you voluntarily do it to yourself. That's the Clive and Bundy thing. We're allowing these things to happen. Um, this is the citizen journalist. Got one right here. <laughs> Taking it on. And this is the way that this is all going to stop. This is why I say there's a big prairie fire that's brewing right now by a lot of people. Orlean Curley and Phyllis Schlafly were two of the major ones in the nation who have been leading the charge. Um, a lot of people are out there going crazy with this, and a lot more states are turning down Race to the Top and Common Core, which is a good thing. Uh, one of the things, this is a, these are some of the amendment threats that we're talking about. Uh, Tenth Amendment Education, Common Core, the Federalization of Schools, uh, which is, of course, in the purview of the, of the, uh, the state. Okay, this is what's happening to uh, Common Core in California. And this is where the real hope is. A lot of educators have figured out Common Core is terrible. The unions have figured out Common Core is terrible. In fact, the unions have said no to Common Core. Well, yeah, the CTA in Southern California has said no. And they're saying, can they continue to say no? Yes, they are. I had the conversation this afternoon with people. And that, but this is what you're hearing, is you're not hearing the full story yet. Because they're slow walking. And the reason why they're slow walking it is because they don't have the money to put it on. You see, we've gotten no money from Race to the Top yet. Did you know that? We got in the grant program. We've gotten some money from the feds. But the feds don't like us. Jerry Brown doesn't like Arnie Duncan, Jordan Arnett, nor does he like Barack Obama. And vice versa. California, the largest state in the Union, is not engaged in Common Core and Race to the Top like all the other states are. The one thing the unions hate is anything dealing with teacher evaluations. So they're fighting that like crazy. The other part of it, though, is from really good teachers, the old school teachers who know how to teach. You know, when I started teaching, I was a terrible teacher. No, it wasn't. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> I taught 16 years in the classroom. And I was awful my first three years. Awful. I had no idea why they gave me tenure. My after, uh, when I, uh, I say this, because when I got to my fifth year, I started really getting in the group. And I, really, I, I became a really good teacher after that. And I got better and better and better and better and better each year. And I felt more confident each year. Well, those teachers, the ones that are in their 15th and 16th and 20th year of teaching, they recognize Common Core for what it is. And a lot of them are saying, I'm not going to teach it. Let's go ahead and, and do the training, which is what's been going on this year in California, right? They've gone through training, and they know what the curriculum is. They did some, what kind of testing was it? Field testing, which means nothing to the kids. See, part of testing which really offends me is you run these kids through all these batteries of tests, like star testing and all that stuff. And this is the devastating thing to schools with the testing regime, is it takes time out of teaching. I figured out of 180 days of, of when we've had kids, we have to devote 60 of those days to testing for sure. 60. 120 days could be used for real teaching. But what was that real teaching all about? To the test. Here's the other gig. None of those tests 
meant anything to the kids and they got no credit for them. Does that make sense? They didn't get a grade, they didn't get credits, but you know who got credit for them? The teachers and the administrators. I was one of them. It was wrong, and it still remains wrong. That's why I say when it's not about the kids any longer, it's all about the educators, that's when we have a problem. And that's where Common Core goes to. So this whole idea of testing and testing and testing takes away from learning, learning, learning. So is it any wonder why we have a 35% dropout rate? The kids are bored. When I opened up my charter school, we didn't just have kids who were called walkouts or dropouts. We had the kids that were walkouts. We were offering shop classes, art classes. And these kids were so excited they couldn't believe it. They didn't have to study for tests all the time. They could actually do things with their hands. And those kids were really excited. But the kids we call the walkouts, good kids, no discipline problems. They're just bored silly in class because they didn't want to sit through all the testing regime stuff. And that's a whole different classification of kids. When I did the preschool, I wish this class was, and the teachers all around and Chico and everything, <coughs> and the private. Oh, oh, wait. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get scolded from that side. <laughs> and that was also said, the dropout. Because the kindergartners going in, and they're taking all the play away. They're putting all the stuff out there that the first grade does. And this is what shows them when they get up to a certain age, you're getting that dropout because they can't make it. The pressure. Right. But it's not only pressure, it's just how their brains are, are developing. They're not ready for that level of, of material. Right. Nor are their hands. Right. They, they don't have the manipulatives. What she said over here was about their brain is not ready for any of this. The other thing that's happened, which is a positive thing, is uh, Senator George Hunter, what's he running for tomorrow? Uh, State Board of Equalization. Um, we did a real uh, about a two-week special on my radio show about uh, kindergartners, and this was about five or six years ago. And one of the problems that we had with kindergartners, because I, I was working on the dropout thing, and I figured it out. That figured that out. And so I got with a whole bunch of kindergarten teachers from around this area, and I went into one of the classrooms on the opening day of school. <laughs> Hello, who I saw in that classroom were four five and six year olds, all in one room. Now, I gotta tell you, that's a hopeless situation to see that, especially for the four year olds. Their hands aren't developed, their brains aren't developed, they don't have the social skills, they just get beat down by the other kids. And so, one of the things we got is George Runner ran legislation, and he was already on top of this, he knew too. Now, I had him on the radio show, and we did a conversation about it, and he introduced legislation this was, I think it took effect last year or the year before, that no longer would a kindergarten student be accepted at age four if they turned five on December 10th. And this is where this came from. And George Runner ran the law that said you have to be five years old, turning six by December 10th, which makes a whole different world. That started, by the way, listen to this, that whole business when they dropped it down a year, the golden year, 1992. I, you know, I get chills when I think about that. But I look at that, that's connected to me. I get it. I get what's going on there. You're dumbing them down at an early age, you're not giving them a chance. Four-year-olds can't use crayons, let alone learn first grade standards. Hello? So it dumbs them down automatically. But George Runner stopped that. So we'll um, let's see. Okay, this is some of the stuff that's happening right here now. I, I, I'm telling you, it's been slow walk. Uh, Tom Torlakson has a phased approach with Governor Brown. He introduced what's called 484, uh, sets a timetable for testing in the startup of the, Cal, uh, the Common Core standards, and it has Arnie Duncan Ballistic that he did that. But here's the deal we got no money. But what did California do anyway? California went out and gave up $2.8 billion of state money to start up the training this year and for next year. 
in the hopes we're going to get money from Race to the Top. And I know what they're going to say. <laughs> we don't like you and no. That's what they're going to do. Fend for yourself. Uh, Lydia Gutierrez is the only one uh, of the three candidates who's against Common Core. Marshall Tuck supports it, and Torlakson kind of supports it. And that's it. There's much more to it, and I've left a lot out, uh, but I'll take your questions. Yes? I just, wanted to know, I just wanted to know exactly what it is they're learning. What is the math going to be like? What is the English going to be like? What is the science and all that? Well, how is it being changed? Okay. Well, first of all, right now they're, they're primarily implementing math and English standards. And, and curriculum from that. And they're making it up basically as they're going. But one of the things that they're doing in English is they're withdrawing and taking out all literature. <coughs> all the classics and all that other stuff, that's all gone. In math, you've seen some of the backwards math that's going on. Uh, it's de designed primarily to solve problems, I guess you would say, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, High-tech answers to technical questions in which you can get multiple answers for the same problem. It's the process they're looking for. They're looking for the process, not, not the end result. Yeah, not the end result. Process is more. What it, what it does to kids is what it would do to you and I. If you learn in that kind of a system, there is no norm. Right? You're really constantly in a state of confusion and dystopia. And that's what this is doing. This is deliberately being done. Deliberately, it's just like what I say about the dropout rates. What we have right now is a mono tracking system for schools. Only the good kids graduate from high school and get into college. The rest of the kids drop out and become dependent or go to jail. And that's the reality. You have a question? I can, no, I don't. I can talk loud. I think what the design is that um, all of the students come to the same conclusion, and, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's like a on, on one mindset. For multiple people, right, yes. right. But it's really massively, did you get that? Mm -hmm. She said that it's, the mindset is to get everybody to reach the same conclusion at the same time based upon the same data that they're studying, yes. and work in groups, group think in other words. And of course, uh, I've seen how that works, and it doesn't work really well. Yes. It, it's terrible what happens, especially for an independent American mind, I might add. Because uh, American kids are unique uh, in education, when you, especially when they're living in a real strong free environment. Yeah. I've, I've read comments about Obama administration being hostile to Christians. Can you tell me how far back evolution has been in education versus creation? Well, the, the, uh, I, I'm a biology and environmental science teacher, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm the kind of guy I ask. Um, the mindset for evolution has been since uh, Darwin, and even well before that. Um, and I never got in the debate with my kids about evolution or creationism, because that wasn't my place as a public education uh, teacher. And I, was, you know, I, I told the parents up front, I never, in uh, 15, 16 years of teaching it, ever had a conflict with that. And I taught in some communities that were really um, uh, very, very strongly Christian uh, communities. And it always had objections to my other fellow teachers. But I never did because I never, I said that's the parent's responsibility. I, I believe as a public education teacher or an educator, parents have to have a role in what's going on with their kids. I can't do it for them. So that question for me was left for the parents and their clergy to decide and talk about. I never put it one way or another. But isn't the education system packing evolution in their head? I'd say yes. And I, it, it's not only just the evolution. It's, it's yeah, they're packing Islam. And atheism. Atheism. Okay. <laughs> I heard you on your radio program talking to a lady one day. Right. Yeah. 
Well, they, they have to retest the kids again so they get more money. And how much per student and how many students? So how much are they making per test? You know, I don't know what that number is now, but it's hundreds of dollars. Um, and this is with the testing company. So uh, uh, if like a high school exit exam. Um, a high school exit exam, a kid will start taking in their sophomore year, and then by hopefully their senior year they've passed it. And if they take multiple tests, then it costs the district multiple money, and this, the testing companies get a hold of that money, get that money, obviously. Yeah? One thing that, <clears throat> one subject here that hasn't been broached is history. Okay. Three years ago, there was an article in the paper about 55 of the most prestigious colleges in this country. Only 2% of the people in those 55 major colleges were taking history. And the rest of them didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah. You know, there's now, a... If you ever give up your history, you have given up everything because you have nothing to go back to. Yeah, one of the things I was going to talk about was, was the history, but there's also a phenomenon that's going around that you might hear me talk about on the radio now a lot, and that's called uh, privilege. White privilege. White privilege. And this is, the, this is from the real racist people. These are the race hustlers that are uh, sort of step up well beyond Obama and all these other people. Uh, it, it's rooted in uh, what's called critical race theory which came out of Harvard, which came from a black professor, and I can't remember his name right now, but he and Obama were best buds. And um, critical race theory says this, that because the Constitution uh, and the Bill of Rights and all the documents and all the institutions were founded by white people, then the institutions themselves are racist. And white privilege goes along with that. And I was gonna play a clip tonight, I just didn't get it on board about this one guy who's been writing Common Core Standards in Connecticut, and he gets up to the audience and says, well, you know, I, I'm standing here as a white guy, and um, I have gotten privileges that I do not deserve as a white guy, but I've been, and, and the crowd just goes nuts. This is the new branding of racism. On, and, you know, I, I got to say, it's not just white people who can extend this to. It's anybody who's against them. They're racist. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Uh, let's look at Alan West. He's white privilege, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's not his skin color, and that's the gig about racist. It's not, yeah, it, it's not the skin color. It's not whether you're white, brown, black, or whatever. It's the heart of a racist who does that, and that's coming down the pike for Common Core. That is what is going to be taught in history and so on, it is the white privilege, uh, the critical race theory, just straight up racism. It's also public correctness. Political correctness, right. Yeah. Boy, isn't it amazing what you're seeing right now with PC? Yeah. My position is don't be PC. Amen. Just don't. And, you know, I get this question when I really start going on some of the stuff when I get callers and people who email me about Common Core and teachers. And there's teachers around here that have called me uh, in both these school districts here, numbers of them and said, what would you do as a teacher with Common Core? I said, I wouldn't teach it. You don't have to teach it. Don't teach it. Do what's right for the kid. You know what the curriculum is going to be. Go out and find it. When, um, I'll, I'll tell this one story, then I'll stop. But when I started the charter school called CTEC, this was back in 2000. We started the school, the building of it, in 2007. We finally opened it in 2010. We opened it up as, the, as California's very first book was school. We didn't have books. We had classroom sets of books because parents were upset that we didn't have books. <laughs> so I bought classroom sets. There we bought everybody an iPad. Now, what we got on board with all the teachers was, you're going to develop your own. Here are the standards. That's what I said to them. Here are the standards. Let's work with the parents and everybody and come up with the curriculum that you can get for free. You can get the curriculum standards and all the, the content for free on the internet. Did you know that? It's all free. So our teachers started to work diligently at putting those standards together and the curriculum together. And they started using the iPad with the kids, and the kids knew exactly where to go to get the curriculum to work on their projects and so on. They all, the standards were tight. It was really exciting. 
Well, it's kind of interesting. I like to tell the story. When three weeks into the uh, after we distributed the iPads, I get an executive, a vice president who will remain nameless, from Apple Computer Cupertino, and the sales rep for the area just unexpectedly show up in my office. And we start talking. I'm going, God, this guy's from Apple Computer. He's a big guy. <laughs> and as it turned out, I said to him after 15 minutes of the conversation, I said, Do you know how powerful the uh, Apple iPad is? And they said, No. They didn't know what they had, and they wanted to know what I was doing. And I told them what I just told you. Well, the book people didn't like that. They just didn't like that. That was what that was the first big you know trial that we had was with the book people. But you know, we saved almost half a million dollars on books with those. That gets back to your book publication because you see, if you want to revise or re-authorize uh, a book or adopt a new uh, new book, you can go on the internet and do it for free instantaneously. So that's kind of a the disadvantage for them. Anyway, Don Fry has a comment. I do. You do. We're going someplace. We are. We have a Tea Party uh, crew set up for uh, April 25th of next year. And Paul Preston is going to go, and he's going to put on seminars about uh, how to win elections and how to do things that uh, will make us better. All legal. <laughs> and we're inviting everybody to come with us. Where are you going? Where are you going? We're going to go to the Western Caribbean. Cozumel, Belize, Grand Cayman Islands, and so forth. You have to keep your ARs at home. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. We have one more announcement. Uh, Kim Ross had a notice she's going to tell us about. By the way, chemtrails are real. They, they truly are. I'm a believer. Hi. Um, the Sheriff's Office of Yuba County is having a fundraiser for their uh, STARS volunteers. It uh, cost us $15 to non-STARS. It's uh, Saturday, June 28th. I'm also taking donations for our awesome STARS group. That's the uh, Sheriff's Team of Active Residents and Service. And anyone can be a volunteer all the way down to 21 up to however old. And we had a STARS volunteer right here, and I don't know where she went. Oh, okay. Yes, I went to her 90th birth, uh, birthday party. So if you are interested in going, contact me. I have the phone number here I can read off if you want to buy a ticket or donate. So we're, I'm taking donations from Cookie Tree. I've already gotten them. And Danielle and Shooter's Paradise, uh, Damsel, uh, and... and um, Thank you. Thank you. That one. Anyway, thank you. Hey, and thank you. That'll conclude our meeting. Uh, we'll see you the 16th. Thank you very much. Right here.